Welcome to uh, this Umbraco hosted uh, webinar. I'm Jonas and I'm a tech partner manager here at uh, Umbraco, joined by uh, Jesper and Marcin today. Um, really happy that, uh, that, that we got this uh, webinar together and really looking forward to it. Um, thanks to our valued uh, tech partner, Interspeed, and uh, thanks to you uh, too for, for joining in, Jesper and Marcin. I know that you're here to share your input on, uh, on migration and transition uh, in relation to migration and give us uh, your expertise and insights on, on those topics. And I, I won't uh, spend too much time on, on explaining who you are. I guess you will do that your, yourself. But one important uh, note for all the participants out there is that uh, we will be answering questions, but uh, feel free to shoot them, uh, uh, shoot them uh, in the chat or in the Q&A session once um, once you have them, and then we'll uh, pick up on, on them uh, at the end of the webinar, where both uh, Jesper and Marcin will uh, will answer questions from uh, from all of you. So uh, yeah, take it away, Marcin and Jesper. Yes, so hello Thank you. everyone. I will start sharing my screen, but I will leave a, a, a chat to you, Jesper. Just let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, perfect. Yes. So yep, over to you. So first off, today we will be talking about transitioning and uh, why a migration might always not be enough. So just first off, migrating and transition is not always easy. And uh, also it's not always the most fun part uh, of the things that you are doing, but there's sometimes things that you have to do. Uh, and doing a transition or migration, that's especially not fun if the site that you end up with after the migration is exactly the same site that you had before the migration. The only new thing is that you get security updates. Uh, so if you end up with a site that has exactly the same features for the editors, for the users, and for your architecture and so on, it's not that motivating as well. And you're not moving your business forward either. So that's why we're talking about transitioning today and not just migration. So, and we're talking about this because, of course, Umbraco 7 is approaching end of life. Uh, actually, that's only four and a half months. So, if, if you have a, a, a big site with a lot of dependencies and so on, you actually might be in a hurry right now. Um, but I think also just as important, at least for me, it's about moving your business forward. And maybe it's a bit prerogative, but for me at least, Umbraco 7 has been end of life for almost two years. And the reason why I'm saying that is because two years ago, Umbraco 7 entered the security only phase. That means it's two years ago since Umbraco 7 received a new feature. And that means that your CMS or at least your Umbraco wise, you haven't moved your business forward for two years. So that's uh, why I'm saying that. So first off, um, a bit about me. My name is Jesper and I work at uh, Enterspeed as a software engineer. I'm building our integrations that we have to various systems, uh, hereby including our Umbraco package that will integrate Umbraco with Enterspeed. And also I have a lot of contact with our customers talking about how they are using Enterspeed, what's working for them, do they have any feature requests and, and so on. And uh, prior to working in Enterspeed, I worked uh, in different agencies uh, building uh, large e-commerce sites and, and content sites for both the private and public uh, sectors. So I also did the transition myself for some of the customers that I have been working with. Um, yeah, and just lastly, I, I just love working with Umbraco and th that's also why I, I like to join this, this webinar. I, I feel the flexibility and the ease of use for, from Umbraco. So a really cool product there. So yeah, that's all for me. I will hand it over to you, Masin. Yep. So my name is Marcin uh, and I'm a CTO and senior solution architect plus country manager uh, at Novicel and one of the agencies doing a lot of work with uh, Umbraco. Uh, I'm also uh, a fact times Umbraco MVP and some of uh, you might know me from a YouTube channel called Umbra Coffee where I on every week I do share a, a weekly uh, update of Umbraco news uh, from amongst of the community and Umbraco itself. Uh, so I try to be up to date on everything what Umbraco uh, has in offer and what Umbraco can do because I used to be a .NET developer and Umbraco developer myself with, uh, as I calculated, 15 plus years of experience doing uh, not only Umbraco projects, but generally solutions where Umbraco uh, is or was a part of. Uh, and uh, I'm very active in the community and everyone can find me uh, almost everywhere. Uh, but uh, the links here will be to, to the LinkedIn, Twitter and email. So in case of any further questions, I will be also uh, open to answer them separately. 
So not uh, waiting too much longer, uh, I can jump to, to my part of the uh, talk uh, because I wanted to focus and share my experiences from the field uh, as a solution architect uh, facing the, 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 the question, which is around the end of life and not only end of life solutions like on Braco, uh, so to update or not to upgrade. And, and that's the question. And of course, uh, as, as Esper mentioned, the end of life started to be a thing for us inside the Ambraco community, because before it was named, uh, there was nothing like that for us as a, as a maintainers of the projects uh, using open source solution like Ambraco is. Uh, but when it was named, uh, it turned out to be a challenge, not a problem, but a challenge because a lot of the uh, the vendors, a lot of the clients uh, started to raise the questions and the considerations of what will be when the end of life will approach. Uh, there are some questions like, will my website explore or stop working uh, when the end of life will happen? And of course, we as a solution architect, developers, agencies, uh, and users, we need to face these questions and we need to address them uh, uh, in front of our clients and our uh, editors and users. So of course, the websites won't, won't blow up and won't explode. But of course, we need to take care of them because we want our clients and our solutions to be secure and, 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 and good enough to handle everything what the internet and the, and the ecosystem around the web can do and, uh, and uh, make for us. So uh, as Microsoft back in the days, maybe some uh, older audience here would uh, remember, uh, embed the Windows uh, XP rest in peace. Uh, it's uh, for our solutions and for our websites. It's not that easy to just make something forgotten. And our projects, I assume, or at least most of them, it's not like a do and forget type of the thing. But uh, we need to maintain them, and we are usually the ones who are in charge of making them secure, performant, and still uh, valuable for for our customers and their their end users. So we cannot forget about them. Hence, we need to choose our own adventure. And we either, either need to update, migrate, or rebuild. Because based on uh, my and our experiences with uh, not only Ambraco, but also other solutions, uh, these are three paths to uh, explore. And uh, I want to focus on some of them by uh, explaining a couple of the uh, use cases uh, from our uh, real life uh, where we needed to really approach this challenge from different perspectives. Uh, so I want to meet, uh, want you to meet John. Uh, and John's team had a simple marketing website. Uh, with not that often changing content. It was built with Umbraco 8 using very basic and built-in uh, Umbraco data types and editors. Uh, John and his teams were very happy from the website, but they want to get the newest features uh, that were offered by the latest Umbraco. And they want to just ensure that they are keeping their systems safe and they want to have a longevity in mind. So very basic solution, very basic website, happy team, happy customer, what to do when it comes to end of life. So we decided to take these steps. We migrated the content. We reused the database from the existing solution, did a file migration, and performed the refactoring of the code to make the uh, underlying implementations working in the newer version of the .NET uh, framework and .NET itself. So custom code need, needed to be rewritten uh, and refactored to be supported in the latest framework. Then we did a plenty of tests, and the client still maintained happy. Uh, Umbraco Cloud has a really nice guide uh, that we followed at the beginning of this journey, and it's linked here on the on the slide. So uh, please uh, do follow and check it out on, on your side because the steps there are were exactly the steps that we've taken, and it made our customer really reuse their content and make the the new Umbraco in work uh, relatively fast and 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 without too many uh, challenges uh, in front of us. So this migration was really fast and easy to be done uh, uh, in the relation to some bigger and more challenging ones that I want to describe further. Uh, second person is Lean, and Lean runs the digital and marketing department in one of the law firms, big law firms. They've inherited very uh, old, uh, old solution built by their mother company back in 2019, uh, and it was done on the greatest and latest Umbraco version 7 then. Uh, the team had a lot of custom requirements. There were a lot of integrations and implementations done on top of the uh, popular community packages then. Uh, and the website um, uh, was reported by the team as very unstable and problematic. So uh, also the UX and the editor's experience required a little bit more love over the time. Uh, so how we helped uh, Aline with uh, their challenges. 
we performed a set of workshops. Uh, we tried to understand what is making them going completely crazy with the editing processes on their side, uh, how the content uh, is structured at the time when it was um, uh, built. Uh, then we considered the architecture a bit, which is the topic of our today's solution. So we consider if the current architecture meets their expectations and their further digital um, um, challenges they will be facing. And then we did a rebuild and refactor as well, because the code needed to be rewritten to support the newer version of the .NET framework as well. And the content was repopulated. In this particular case, it was the easiest and the fastest uh, solution for their uh, challenge. But based on the requirements uh, and the workshop that we've performed with the client, we decided that the content is not in the best shape and the content structure required to be recreated, to be fair. And that's why we took this approach. But we recreated the architecture with the more complex connections in between of the systems, tested a lot, and made another customer happy after the migration as well. And third, last uh, persona to discuss today is Sven. And Sven is Matt, our uh, good guy because he's also a solution architect. He was leading the team uh, and their company producing electrical chargers for, uh, for cars. Uh, and their website was built in 2020, so relatively not that far away in time. And it was developed with the single page application, very fancy and good content uh, in front of the APIs exposed by the uh, website and the third parties. Uh, but their compliance team uh, noticed the information about their backend solution, Umbraco, uh, going end of life soon. And they've requested the team to update it before the end of life date. And Sven's team was mainly front-end team. And they don't want to deep dive into a .NET and VC part because they don't want to get lost in that. They prefer much more the JavaScript part of it. So we helped Sven and their team as well, because we sit down with them and perform the architecture diagram and API specification. We created a couple of the new endpoints and we considered, for example, tool like EnterSpeed to help us to replace the endpoints with the new endpoints with the data coming from the different sources. And then we did a content population uh, and we, our migration because we could consider also using for, uh, for this particular case. Uh, and tested a lot as well. And Sven's team was using the same front end for the different data source, and it was all working fine. Uh, so that's uh, the case where uh, uh, the architecture was already in place for a migration like this. So we did uh, accomplish the goal, and Sven and the team become happy. These three solutions shows us that there are various motivations and decision drivers to perform the upgrade. Uh, one can be just features. And if uh, you can take a look on our Umbraco website where we can compare releases, uh, this is a real case from one of the customers. Uh, they migrated from version 7, 5.7 .7 to version 10 back in the days, and they received 726 new features just because of this update. And the just in the CMS features, not to mention almost 3000 issues and uh, bugs fixed and tasks done in between at the time with a lot of breaking changes in between. So just CMS features received by this upgrade were worth this migration path, for example, for this particular client. Other decision driver might be a low or compliance. Processing sens sensitive data in uh, co correlation with the end of life solution is not a good thing. And there are some restrictions of this. So it might be a compliance thing or compliance report coming out of the um, uh, scans or a red flags being raised by the security teams. And there are underlines real, real security issues which might be popping out if the tool will become unsecure and there will be some kind of holes or potential uh, issues to address from the perspective of the people who are not that happy to uh, help us uh, sustain in the web. And last but not least, new, modern, and fancy architecture. There's a lot of materials about the MAC principles around microservices, API first, cloud native and headless solutions. Uh, and for example, the front-end teams that want to drive and steer the, the solutions, collecting the data from the various locations, sources, or publish the information to the different destinations. So using migration or this kind of opportunity in front of us, instead of just copying over solution one-to-one, -one, just changing the backbone of it, is not always uh, the wrong thing. And in most of the cases, I would say is the best thing because we can do two things in the same go and not only migrate to the latest and greatest Umbraco version, but also do more uh, backbones and, and preparations for the future uh, and integrations with the other systems. And I wanted to use a quick examples of the e-commerce solutions where we captured the different generations uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the systems and solutions that evolved a lot from the past where we had almost only front-end and back-end systems to the 
digital composable channels where we have various destinations back and forth front end and where the content in all of these solutions is just a small piece of the puzzles. So we really need to think about building our solutions around these puzzles and with these puzzles, not just with the one puzzle that is solving one particular problem and forgets about the others that might pop in or pop out in the nearest future. And when we choose this strategy, we consider it uh, by the uh, composability by the enterprise uh, suit or standard suits where some of it is better, some of it is not maybe meant to be the solution uh, capable for this particular project. So it's always uh, depending from the, uh, the need and the particular solution. And uh, for example, multi-market, multi-channel, multi-brand businesses or simple content websites that are relatively easy to be updated. And then if we'll take it all combined, we need to, again, back to the initial step and choose our own adventure. So either upgrade, either rebuild, or re either migrate using tools like, for example, EnterSpeed. And then I'm handing it over to you, Jesper, to take it more technical and deep uh, when it comes to your solution and what EnterSpeed can offer because we also use that in some of our migrations. But so over to you. Thank you. I will just share my screen. Yes, are you able to see my screen? Perfect. Yeah, so now I'll be talking about the transition versus migration phase. And we'll be talking about why a migration is not always enough. And what do I even mean when I say transition uh, throughout this, this webinar? So, um, so first off, let's talk about the difference when I talk about migration and transition. So if we're talking about a one-to-one -one migration, it could be because end of life for, from Umbraco 7. And there's a couple of steps that you need to go through. Uh, and this is not a complete list uh, or step-by-step -step guide. It's just some of the steps that you need to go through. Uh, so you definitely want somehow to migrate your content from Umbraco 7 to Umbraco 11. You also want to move your media files to a new storage, maybe. You also want to upgrade your .NET fr from .NET framework to .NET. Um, as supported by the new Umbraco versions. And of course, as uh, Marcin mentioned, there's a lot of breaking changes that you also need to fix uh, doing the upgrade. And if you just do this uh, one step at a time, then as I talked uh, about in the beginning, you just end up with a site as you had before, but now you got the security updates. Of course, there's also some features that you get out of the box that you don't need to implement in Umbraco 11. Uh, and you also get some performance boosts uh, by, by using Umbraco 11 compared to, to 7, uh, primarily because of the .NET um, version. Um, so instead, I want to be talking about transition, and that's where you can actually move your business forward. So maybe you also want to upgrade your architecture and use that opportunities. So you're forced to do a migration somehow because end of life. But you could take that opportunity to also upgrade your architecture at the same time and actually moving your business forward. Of course, you still need to migrate your content uh, somehow. But the important thing here is to start to get advantages of some of the new features or possibilities that you have been, been given. Um, it, it could be if you are running a um, Bracken 7 site and it's a multilingual site, maybe you want to start looking into the, to the new features that were introduced back in 8 point something. I can't remember the exact uh, minor version, but where you can build actually a multilingual uh, website. Maybe that will help your editors to, to maintain the website. Maybe you also want to look into some of the new property editors that it was introduced in newer versions of Umbraco. Uh, that could help your editors build new and more fancy websites without uh, developers needing to do a lot of stuff every time. So a transition, that's what you do to move your business forward. Uh, so that that's basically it. Um, and, and just a, a small video here, if you're just upgrading the engine only, then you end up with, with something like this. Uh, and uh, this is Adam Savage. Uh, you may know him from, from Mythbusters. He's testing one of these Buster and Dynamic uh, robots to, uh, together with a, an old backend. So that's what you get if you only update the engine, or update on Braco without taking advantage of new the features. So let's talk in a little bit about uh, enter speed. 
and especially for you guys who haven't worked with Interspeed before, because we will use Interspeed in some of the demos that I will share uh, later on, I like samples of how you can use Interspeed to ease the transition phase. Um, so a brief introduction, what is Interspeed? Well, we like to call it a speed layer. Um, and what do you get from that speed layer? First off, you get a custom API meaning that you can decide whatever the API, what data that the API should return for you. And that will depend on what data you need for your front end. So you can use that API as a, a, as a headless API between Umbraco and your front end if you want to separate the back end and the front end. You also get a performance by intelligent caching. So that means that whenever you ingest data into Interspeed, we'll automatically process that data and put it in directly into the cache. So whenever you fetch the data, it will be directly from the cache and you don't need to think about revalidating, uh, invalidating the cache either manually or at regular intervals. It also gives you the possibility to combine data from multiple sources. And that's something that we will use in the later examples. Um, and it also means that you can actually if you look at the next point here, you get effective decoupling. So you don't need to integrate all your systems that you have together. Uh, typically back in the days, we saw that the CMS was the main center and then you had all these integrations into the CMS, either because you needed to show the data on the front end or maybe you needed your editor needed to select a product and you needed that product to bind that with some content that you had in the CMS or something like that. So here you can use enter speed to be that integration hub instead. It also means that you don't need to, to scale, let's say you're in Braco installation to multiple servers to handle a lot of load because the load will be on the Interspeed delivery API and not your backend system. So that means that you can have your Braco installation running on a single server and it's only the editors that actually need to access that Braco server. The front end doesn't know anything about uh, Braco behind the scenes. So if when you're working with Enterspeed, there is three steps that you need to work with. So first up, that will be to ingest all the data that you have or you want to work with into Enterspeed. And you can do that from whatever system that you might have. We are not tied to any CMS or PIM system or whatever. Um, the second one, that would be where you're modeling the data. So this is where you're mapping the data that you are ingesting into Enterspeed to the output that you actually want to use in the front end. And we're using uh, low code schemas for that. As of now, it's JSON schemas, but we're actually working actively on uh, JSON uh, JavaScript schemas, meaning that you get way more flexibilities of how you can do your mapping. And it also gives that benefit that it's a language that most developers are already familiar with. So it will lower the entrance barrier. And last off, that's where you're fetching all the data that you, that you need for your front end and you're only fetching the data that you really need to present on the given page because of the modeling that you are doing in the middle. So at the left side, we have all your systems, all your backend system, PIM system, CMS, or whatever systems that you, that you might have. And you are done ingesting the data into Interspeed. And you can ingest the data using a REST API, using a .NET SDK, or some of the integrations that we already have in place. So we have integrations for the most popular systems that our customers are using. And of course, that includes Umbraco in this case. Um, I also want to mention that our packages, all our integrations are open source. So if we don't have an integration for a system that you're using, you can look at some of the integrations that we have already built, use that as an inspiration to build the integration yourself. Or often we will also help build that integration uh, for you. Uh, and that also means that just like uh, the Umbraco CMS, that you can build your own pull request uh, with new feature requests, uh, if you have bug fixes and so on, uh, to help improve or evolve the products. The second part, we already talked about that, that's where you're doing the modeling. You can combine data from multiple sources into one view. And uh, the last part is the delivery API, and that's where you fetch the data for whatever front end that you uh, are building. It could be your website, your post system, uh, a mobile app, or whatever. 
And once again, we have a, a REST API here and you can use a .NETSDK SDK as well if you're working in a .NET world. So let's start transitioning. So I will be talking about different ways how you can use EnterSpeed to modernize, modernize your architecture and doing this transition. So the first of, that's the very small example that Masin also talked about. A very basic website, uh, no, not much custom code, no integrations and so on. So it's a very simple site uh, and maybe it's easy for you to just do the migration or update the architecture in one go. Or maybe you don't even need to update the architecture because it's just that simple site. The second example I will be going through and I will be giving a demo of that as well. It's a more complex size, complex site. So you have dependencies between your front end and your back end. Uh, you might also have a lot of custom code uh, in the application. So one way of transitioning here is that I will be show that you can actually opt start by updating your architecture and then do the migration afterwards. Because once you are separated, let's say the front end from the back end, it will also be way easier for you to migrate the back end because you don't have all these dependencies. So basically that's the key set concept for all these paths that you can take for a transitioning is just to break down into smaller steps that will make it way easier for you. And the last uh, case that I'll also be demoing, that's the monolith that we all know about. So that will be the CMS that you have in the middle and you have all these great integration from different systems into the CMS. It could be your commerce platform. It could be any other third party systems that you have integrated into your CMS. And with that solution, it's very, very hard to do a migration of the CMS because you have all these dependencies. So separating them out, and then you can do a transition of one of the component one at a time. And that will lower the risk of errors and it will also provide more confidence in the estimates. Um, and I would even um, suggest that you take one component separated from the, from the main system, and then you can deploy that component to the production environment. So you do that one component at a time. It will also be, if you introduce some error, it will also be way easier for you to identify the error and where the error is actually happening because you only change a small part of the system and not the entire system at one go. So the first example here, that was the small sites that we talked about, very simple sites. So you have an Umbraco 7 site here and you have an old front end running. You're using the Umbraco API to render that front end. So they are very tight, uh, tightly coupled, uh, the front end and the back end. So the first step here, that could be to introduce EnterSpeed as a headless API and then build a new front end to separate the front end and the back end. But as we also talked about, this is maybe a very small site. So maybe you don't need all the, the benefits that you get from having a headless setup. So maybe it's okay to just do this only upgrade the CMS from Umbraco 7 to Umbraco 11. Maybe you still need to reuse the old back or the old front end. Maybe you want to build a new front end, that's okay. Um, but of course, there's still all these breaking changes that you need to take care of. Um, and once again, it's very important that you start at least looking into some of the new possibilities that you have been given from Umbra Umbraco 11, as we talked about earlier. So that's very important in order to move your business forward. Um, so one of the things that you also need to do here is of course, migrate the content. Uh, as Marcin showed, there's a lot of breaking changes. There's a lot of new features going on from Umbraco 7 to Umbraco 11 or Umbraco 10, if you need the long-term support for that matter. Um, so I guess in some cases it might be easier just to spin up a new Umbraco 11 instance and then migrate your content. Um, so one way you could do the migration of the content could be to use uh, using migrations just to migrate the content one to one. Um, or maybe you also need to think about the content. Do I actually need a copy one to one uh, from the existing site to the new site? Maybe you want to modernize or update some of the most important pages that you have. So maybe it will be better for you to just rewrite these pages yourself uh, in Umbraco 11. And then you can use an automated migrator to migrate some of the, let's say all your long list of news articles or blog pages that you don't want to rewrite because they are just as they are and they should probably not change. 
So that's also something that you could think about in this phase. What about the content? Do I need to update that? So this second example that we have here is for the more complex site. So once again, I have the same starting point and I'm Braco 7 and an old front end. But this time I have a lot more custom code. I have a lot more dependencies. So maybe the first step in this case would be to actually separate the front end and the back end. Uh, and then you can afterwards migrate your CMS because you have way fewer dependencies at that time. So let me show you uh, an example of, of that. So right here, I have an old Umbraco 7 installation running. If you just very briefly look into the site, uh, I have a, a homepage here with some hero informations, I have a content uh, using nested content. Uh, you can do a small changes of settings to change the theme of the, uh, of the site. Then I have a lot of content pages here with fairy tales by Hans Christian, Hans Christian Andersen. And also here up here, I have a page called products and that page contains a, a single product. And that's a book that you can buy on this website. I have also, if you go into settings and look here, I have an Interspeed tab. And that's because I have installed the Interspeed package. And that's just a, a Nougat package that you can, can install. Or from Umbraco 7, you can install it directly from the back office if you want to. And the only thing that you need to take care of is that you need to set up the API key for your Interspeed uh, tenant. So once that install, it means that whenever editors uh, update content, create new content or media items for that matter, the content will automatically be ingested into Interspeed. So if we jump into Interspeed, we can look at sources. So that was the first step that we saw in the previous slide. So if I look at Umbraco 7, we can see here that I have 22 source entities ingested. And if we look at the home node, we can see the information that we had on the Umbraco page. So we have the hero header and so on. So let's, if I jump into so the homepage here, just write that this is a demo and I can click save and publish. So if I jump back to enter speed and reload it, we can now see that it says, this is a demo. So the content is automatically ingested into enter speed. The second step that we have here, that's our, that's my schemas. So that's where I use to transform the data. And as of now, we will not look into to the schema itself, but I just want to show that I have schemas for my home page, my content page, and also for, for my product as well. And the last part, that's the generated views. So that's the output of the mapping that you're doing. And that's the data that you're fetching from the delivery API. So the last step here in uh, the transition phase, that will be the front end. So right here, I have a new front end that I have built. It's built using React and Next.js, but the content stack is completely up to you, of course. But this website doesn't know anything about the backend. So it's just using our delivery API to enter speed to fetch the data. So I effectively decoupled these two systems. I have the fairy tales that we saw up here. Uh, with the text and I have the, the product uh, that you can buy the single the book here. So that was the second step, the middle, the step in between. So the last step that would be to migrate from Umbraco 7 to Umbraco 11. So I also have a new site here. It's running uh, Umbraco 11, running in Umbraco Cloud. So if I just sign in using my Umbraco ID, So if we look at this site on Braco 11, I have exact the same content. It's just migrated one-to-one -one using, using migration. And I did the migration on a local version of my Braco Cloud site so that I could test that all the content is working, is looking as I was expecting. And after that, I could use Braco Deploy to push the content, all the document types to my live Braco Cloud site. Um, 
So now I have these two backends. So the only thing left to do is to change the front end to use the content from Umbraco 11 instead of Umbraco 7. So down here, I have my code editor. And the only thing that I need to change is that I, right now I'm using an Interspeed API key that's pointing to my Umbraco 7 uh, source inside um, Interspeed. So if I remove that and add the Umbraco 11 uh, key instead, then I'll just need to restart my website here like that. And then I can go back to my front end. And we can see we are using the exact same front end without any code changes. But now I'm getting my content from Umbraco 11. And so that would be one way that you can do the transition and break it down to smaller steps. First off, migrating the front end, push that to the live environment. After that, you can do a transition of the Umbraco with any, without any all these dependencies that you have. Perfect. Let's jump on to the third example that we have. So that would be the monolith. So down here, I have Umbraco 7. I have a commerce platform. I have any third party system. So once again, break it down to smaller steps. So the first step that will be to separate all these different components. So I've separated the front end, I separated the commerce platform, I separated any third party systems that I might have. And right here, I'm using Enterspeed, the power that we can have all these different sources and we can merge the data inside Enterspeed to whatever the front end need. You probably want to do this into smaller steps. So here I had both separate out the front end, the commerce, the third party systems, but I would suggest doing that one at a time, uh, once again, to, to ease the migration. And as before, the last step here, now that I can do a migration of Umbraco 7 to Umbraco 11, and it's way easier for me to do it now because I don't have all these dependencies. So let's look at an example um, for that as well. So I have another uh, Umbraco 7 uh, site running here. And it's more or less a copy of the content that we saw from the first uh, version, except that I don't have uh, the products here anymore. I only have the products page itself, but the, the real products I have separated out to a real commerce platform. And uh, in, in this case, just for the sake of this uh, webinar, my uh, commerce platform here, will just be an Umbraco 11 uh, installation. Uh, you probably want to, don't want to do that. You will use a real commerce engine, uh, but this is just to showcase how you can have multiple systems uh, working together with it to speed. So in this Umbraco 11 installation, I only have that single product. Uh, and that's the exact same product as we saw before. So if we look into enter speed once again, I just switch to a, another tenant here. So if we look at all, look at all the source entities that we have, so if we look at Umbraco 7, see that now I had 21 entities before I had 22, because that's I have separated out the single product that we had. So if we look at the source from Umbraco 11, that would be your commerce platform. Uh, I only have uh, two entities. I have a, a folder here, just to a container for the product, and then I have the, the product itself. Uh, so once again, using the exact same front end, I'll just go back to my code editor. I'll once again, change the API key to the new tenant that I was just showing you. And if we restart the website once again, jump into our front end website, we can now see that we are now using, uh, once again, the exact same front end without any code changes but the data is coming from multiple systems right now, both coming from Umbraco 7 and Umbraco 11. So if I go into the product page that we have, we can see that the page itself, that's coming from Umbraco 7, but this single product here, that's coming from another installation of Umbraco. Um, and I can even click into the, to, to see the product details and I get a page, nice page URL up here, but even though that this page is not living inside uh, Umbraco 7. So that's how you can use um, Enterspeed to combine data from multiple sources. So if we look into to Enterspeed, 
and look at one of the schemas. So let's look at the products schema. So that's the schema that's actually combining the data from the two Umbraco installations. So if we're looking at that one, first off, we have something called triggers. And I don't want, don't want to go into details about it, but basically it, it just says, when should we run this uh, schema? When is this schema triggered? And this is triggered whenever you ingest an entity of type products into the Umbraco 7 uh, source. So we have the page title, SEO meta description that we are mapping from the Umbraco 7 page. But down here, we have the list of products. And I'm just doing a lookup here and just checking all the types of entities that is of type product. And I'm looking in the Umbraco 11 source. So this is where the magic happens, where we're combining the data from the two, uh, two platforms into one uh, view. Perfect. Um, the last thing that I want to, to show you, we also talked about the property editors. Um, that you want to use some of the new property editors to give your editors new possibilities. And if we look at the product from the first Umbraco 7 installation that we had, we saw on the features here, we have you can add some different features to a product uh, in this uh, CMS version here. And in my case, I have added language to the book. It's in English. I added the number of pages. And this is nested content. But as of Umbraco 11, nested content has been marked as obsolete. You can still use it, but you need to, to activate it to, to, to use it. But it also means that it will be removed from future versions of Umbraco. So you also need to think about how do I migrate uh, these property types. Um, so in my new Umbraco 11 instance here, where I have the product, I have migrated the features and it's now using um, the block list instead of the nested content. But I still have the same content. But as we saw, I did not do any changes to my front end website. It's just receiving the exact same content. So it's in the schemas in Enterspeed where I'm doing the mapping a little bit different because the input is different, but the output will be exactly the same. Um, yes. So I think that was uh, all for me. And uh, I think the the last thing will be uh, questions, if any. Thanks a lot, uh, Jesper and Marcin. Uh, really, uh, really good demo, uh, Jesper, and, and thanks for conceptualizing both of you. Um, we do have a question coming in from uh, from Paul Seal, um, who is asking, this is a very compelling demo. How much does it cost to actually use Enterspeed? I don't know if you can answer that, uh, Jesper. And if anybody else has questions, please fire away. Uh, very brief, I can, it's normally not, not something that I talk about, but but you can uh, spin up a free instance of Interspeed, and I can't remember, you can have 5,000 source entities, and I can't remember the number of uh, delivery requests that you can have. So for very small sites, you can use uh, Interspeed for free. And then if you start adding more entities and so on, then you will start to, to have a price to pay. So jump into to enter speed and start a free uh, free tenant. And then you off. Thanks, Jesper. There's also another question here: Is the enter speed uh, support only for Umbraco Cloud, or can this be used on on-prem Umbraco as well? It can be be used on uh, on-premise as well. So uh, the Umbraco Seven uh, sites that I was using, they are just I had just them running on my local site and you can host them on Azure or whatever you want to, to host your website. Yeah. Cool. Um, then we have a question from Tomas. Uh, you advertise for the free upgrade from U7 to U11, but I couldn't see that in, in your demo. You used U-Sync uh, to migrate content. Am I missing something? That's his question. Yeah. So in Enterspeed, we can help doing uh, the migration of content uh, from one platform to another. But just to be straight up honest, if you're working with Umbraco 7, up upgrading from an old Umbraco 7 to a new Umbraco, then using migration can do a way better job than we can do. Um, 
And that's just basically because you think know all the information about the document types. It knows which icon that you have put on the document type. It knows how you have uh, structured your properties in tabs and groups and so on. And it knows the types of all the properties that you have. And we don't have all these information in EnterSpeed. So basically, if you're doing it from Umbraco to Umbraco, I would suggest using using migration or any other tools that you, that's, that's out there. But where we might help, be able to help you, that is if you're doing a migration from, let's say, from Sidecore to Umbraco or from Dynamic Web to Umbraco and so on, then we have a tool that can help you at least uh, a long way of the journey. Uh, there might be some changes that you still need to do, but, but we can help you with that. But this is also what I can add to, to this question because we often see the, the the biggest challenge in this part of the of the update or migration. And uh, as I've mentioned on, on my part of the presentation, it's a, it needs to be a kind of very easy decision to be made that exactly the content in the structure as it is on the existing V7, V8 website is the exact needed in a copy or migrated uh, um, con uh, content uh, at the end server. And, and this is where often uh, there's a room for uh, changes and upgrades or updates of the content as, as we did in some of the uh, paths we, we discovered today as well. So uh, but I, we also did use uh, using Migrate and a couple of other tools available on the uh, community market to, to help us with it. Uh, but in some of the cases, create creation content from scratch using new editors, new functionalities, for example, blog read, blog list, uh, or any uh, other things that are not that easy to be mapped out, or maybe they could help us to build content or editors build content better. Uh, it was better to recreate instead of uh, migrate content. But of course, at the same time, the underlying code uh, and layers of the integrations and implementations were in a need of refactoring still. Uh, so content was just written as a content. And this might be worth mentioning because uh, I, I think from the experience that I had, uh, this was the most problematic part because uh, it's still a content management system and if content is, is really the most important part of it. We actually have, do have quite a lot of questions, so I guess we'll go a little yeah. bit over time. Uh, as uh, as I wrote to as an answer, we we will be sending out the recording. So if anybody has to jump, we will be sending out the recording afterwards. But uh, Sir Ankotel here has a a, a question: uh, Would it be possible uh, for front developers to build slash architect the delivery schemas without having actual data ingested, and you and you start as a starting point for uh, building the front end? And then he uh, follows up with using migrations is great for migrating content in a similar architecture, but do you think Enterspeed would be better if you need to move things around in your CMS, e.g. merging old one-to-one -one language versions to the real language versions in Nubag 8? Okay, so there was two questions. Uh, so if you take the first one first, it was about front-enders uh, building the, or mapping the schema to the delivery API. Uh, so yes, often in our uh, from our customers, we see that it's the front end uh, who's building or modelizing the schemas because they know what content they need on the front end. And it's basically just, as you saw a little brief introduction of, it's JSON. So front end developers knows about this. And also when we introduce JavaScript schema as well, it's also on the path of the front, of the front enders. Uh, but yes, you can start building the, uh, the schemas without having any data. Uh, but one of the benefits, I haven't showed you that for the demo, but when you're working and building the schemas, if you have content at the same time, then you can actually have the source entities side by side with the schema and you can just do a, do a real test uh, every time you do a change to the schema. So if you don't have the content at that time, it, it might be, be hard for you to get the schema exactly correct. Um, but we are working on features. Uh, we have them in, in our backlog. Uh, so you can just inside Enterspeed directly at uh, source entities. So you don't need the integration from the backend team first. You can just add a, a small snippet of, of JSON code. And then you have something to test against. Um, yeah. Uh, what was the second question? The second question was, you think migrations is great for migrating content and similar architecture, but do you think Enterspeed would be better if uh, would be better if you need to move things around in your CMS, e.g. merging old one-to-one -one language versions to the real language versions in Umbago 8 plus? Um, I know from, from the integrate, uh, migrator that we have, you can add, you can hook into different places. So if you need to map complex types, then you can do that. Uh, and then you will do the mapping yourself 
because we don't know what type that you're coming from and what type you want to go to. Um, so that's that's the way you will do that uh, using enter speed. But I guess I would imagine that you think also have uh, some of these features. At least I know they have an extension where you can convert with a click of a button, convert the nested content type to block lists uh, at least. But I would expect they also have things that you can hook into. Um, at, at, at this, I would add uh, that, that you've, you've mentioned this part of the steps between before uh, decoupling a solution. And I think the uh, one of the this steps might be the content migration because it might be done with different tools uh, and, and, and mm -hmm. it might also involve the human interaction between and not be possible to be fully automated, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. But this, this is where uh, the, the enter speed layer might be detached. And, and at the same time, the front end team, which was exactly the case in our uh, situations, was already working on the uh, presentation layer and uh, also adding it to the previous answer you that you did, the front enders already map, were mapping the, the the markup and the the views to the data that they were expecting and the backend team was doing the work of the migrating content uh, between the umbrella versions and different data types so it's, it might be not uh, automated but at the same time it might be done simultaneously um, and it shortened the process a lot yeah yeah i guess that's the key point it's not you don't need always need a one-to-one -one migration, but if you can just migrate at least the hard part uh, or most of the pages, uh, then it, then you always always come a long way. Yeah. Very cool. Um, a couple more questions, and I guess we'll take a couple of them and then uh, we'll answer all of them afterwards and, and follow up. But uh, Paul Seal asks, uh, do you have a psycho uh, connector? Uh, yes, we have a psycho connector. Um, so you can use that package just as, as I showed uh, here, it will work in the same context. So whenever you update content and so on, it will be ingested into to enter speed as well. Yeah. We like that at a Waco, I have to <laughs> say. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, a complete new front end needs to be built from React or any other front end technology only as this, we need to use APIs from enter speed to map content. Uh, do you understand the question there? Yeah, so so what I have sh showcased here is that we are using the delivery API to deliver data to a headless front end. So it's, it's separated from the back end to the from the front end. Um, if you just want to use the the Umbraco API, if you don't need a headless setup, then maybe you don't need a, maybe you don't need enter speed. Uh, maybe you can just use enter speed for some of the transitioning phases, um, depending on how you want to do it. Um, but you can just as easily, if you want to, to build your new front end using the Umbraco API, uh, using race of views and so on, that's com completely fine. Um, but I great. think that, that also follow up the answer to that is that uh, the front end is not forced to be used with React. There is no one library that you say that supports React. Uh, we we did it with the Vue.js front ends. But what is the benefit from the architecture perspective? I think of using platforms like Enterspeed is like where we can completely detach front end from the back end, and front end can consume the content from wherever it's coming from. And what can be also done, as you've proved by the example, that you can change the data source without changing the front end uh, at all. So uh, if, if we'll decide to use any other CMS, like maybe Sidecore, maybe a, even anything else to, as a data source, it can be swapped on enter speed without affecting front end build. So front end is built at once, either it's Vue.js, React, or pure vanilla JavaScript. It's not yeah. requiring anything uh, then to change the data source on uh, because it's coming from the delivery API from enter speed. Yeah. And I also think it will put you in a better position. So when you do need to do the migration next time, it will be easier for you because you don't need to do all these steps that we showed uh, once again. Uh, and I know now Umbraco is pushing major versions every uh, six months instead. So maybe the changes will not be that that big every time. Uh, but still, if you stay on Umbraco 10 for 10 years, then there might be a lot of changes uh, once again, and you need to do the same uh, routine once again and handle all these breaking changes. And also maybe one follow up to that, Umbraco backend back can be hidden completely, as you mentioned, Jesper, as well. So the, the, the part of ingesting the data might not be even exposed to the public. So uh, when it comes to security scans, all the vulnerabilities that are coming from, for example, from um, front-end related MVC engine that we've seen in the past, it's no longer affecting the solution because it's pure front-end that is consuming the content from 
the APIs, uh, which are uh, most often public and, and authenticated as well. So some of these issues are already hidden and you can swap easily CMSs without being uh, worried about security. Well, we do have a, lot, uh, a couple more questions, but uh, we will make sure to answer them uh, afterwards. I want to say a huge thank you, Jesper and Marcin, for, uh, for a great presentation. Um, thanks a lot. And uh, looking forward to perhaps the next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.